Well, good morning. I, we are so glad you're here. My name is Derek. I'm one of the assistant pastors here at Emmanuel. If you're a guest here today, you're our honored guest. We have people in the lobby making their way in. Guys, we have sun today. Like I can already see the smiles on faces as people came in. We're looking forward to worshiping this morning. We're going to start this morning by worshiping God. So let's go ahead and stand. Hey, good morning, Emmanuel family. Let's stand together and worship song number 20 in your hymnals or the words are on the screen. Hey, let's praise him this morning with our worship. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our life's redeemer. Sing, oh, worth his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangel sing. singing this morning. You're going to hear a song by the choir next. You may be seated. You're going to hear a song by the choir next called The Blood of Jesus Speaks for Me. And listen, if you're here this morning, Jesus Christ died to pay for your sins and his blood has paid it all. Think about these words as the choir sings.
It's a little bit bittersweet to say what I'm about to say on this video, but I am taking my last child to college, and that's why I'm not here with you today. And believe me, I would rather be here. <laughs> uh, we saved a week of our vacation time for the end of the summer, and we tagged that on to uh, taking our daughter to college. And so we are praying for you today. We will miss worshiping with you. Uh, we will be cherishing our final moments before Dana and I become empty nesters uh, to some degree. We're excited about this step for her and for our family, but we're also, as you can imagine, a little bit emotional and nostalgic, and so uh, we're cherishing these last moments with her before she starts college. Thank you for being our church family. I was saying to Haley this past week, and she was commenting about all of you saying goodbye to her, and you're excited for her going to college. And I said, Haley, I think it's really neat that our church family has really rooted for you and cheered you on and prayed for you uh, over the last six years as our family transitioned to Connecticut. You've been uh, the best church family I could ever, ever imagined for our fam family to transition to. So as we begin our seventh year together, uh, please know our hearts are deeply embedded here. We love you. We can't wait to get back and serve God with you. We're so excited about the fall. And so I just invite you to enjoy the day. Uh, Pastor Stephen Montepeque is preaching this morning. I know he'll be an encouragement to you, and we look forward to being home soon. All right, if you will, go ahead and take out your bulletin you should have received on the way in. And uh, again, we are so thankful you are here today. Uh, what a powerful song, Pastor Lance and choir. Thank you for that. If you're visiting with us today, that is the message of the whole Bible. And we're so excited about sharing more of that with you today. Um, and again, if you are our guest, we're glad you're here. And we just want to encourage you to relax, enjoy uh, your time here. We're all normal people uh, just learning about God and how broken we are and how much we need him. And, uh, and so we're glad you're here. Uh, inside your bulletin, there is a connection card. I want to ask everybody, if they would, to go ahead and take that out for a second. And uh, we want to ask that you would do two things. First of all, that you would share a prayer request with us. As a staff, we get these on Monday morning and we pray through these uh, throughout the week. And we want to know how we can be praying for you this week. And then if you are visiting with us today, we'd love to know how you heard about Emmanuel. And if you would just take a, a second between now and the end of the service and fill this out and let us know in particular how'd you hear about us, we would appreciate that. At the end of the service today, uh, the ushers are going to receive an offering, and during that time, you can drop your cards in there, or you can go back to the next step tables. There's four of them located in the back of the building and one in the lobby, and at any of those tables, there's going to be some friendly people there who'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. If you're visiting, we have a gift for you. And so when you go back there or stop by there, just let them know you're, you're visiting today. They'd like to put a gift in your hand. One of the things inside of that gift is a book our pastor wrote uh, called Done, What Most Religions Don't Tell You About the Bible. And we'd love to put that in your hands as well as a coffee mug and some other gifts. Just a way for us to say thank you for being here this morning. At Emmanuel, it's really important that we connect. We, we love connecting with one another, especially the beginning of the week. And so at this time, we want to ask everybody to stand. Say hello to someone around you. Hey, church family and guests, go ahead and find your seat at this time. If you are a guest this morning, thank you so much for choosing Emmanuel to worship uh, today. Listen, right at the back of our worship center are what we call our next step tables. So don't forget to stop 
by there on your way out, we have a gift just for you. Hey, this morning, put aside everything bad that happened this past week, and let's focus on Christ. Hey, may we look at him and say, God, open the eyes of my heart. Lord, help me to see that situation differently. Lord, help me to look at your truth with a heart of faith this morning. Open the eyes of my heart. Here we go. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. One more time, open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart. sing a song next called Reckless Love. We began learning this last week. How many of you have ever sung this before? Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. May we think about this this morning as we sing. Before I spoke a word, Coming after me There's no one you won't kick 
town Lying once and now Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lying won't tear down Coming after me I wish you could stand up here and hear what it sounds like. There's nothing like coming together on Sunday and worshiping our God. And the message behind that song and the songs we've heard this morning is what we're all about. And uh, we are so excited about, in just a moment, Pastor Stephen is going to be preaching God's word. And it's going to be a message that this song really alludes to. Uh, we're going to hear a special right now called Rescuer that points to the same message. And, uh, and I just want to encourage everyone to have an open heart to hear from God's word today. I promise it will encourage you. Uh, for some, it may give you answers that you've been looking for. Last week, we had a gentleman uh, at the end of the music. I, I had lunch with him this week, and he said, by the end of the music, I was ready to put my full faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And uh, what an exciting thing to be a part of coming together on Sundays and hearing the word of God. You can be seated. We're going to hear a special, and then Pastor Stephen, come on up. in church, right? That's okay. It's all good. Let's go back to the beginning. Here we go. Cool, yes. He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. There's good news for the captive, good news for the shame. There is good news for the one who walked away. There is good news for the doubter, the one religion failed. For the good Lord has come to seek and save. He's our rescuer. Rescuer, he's our rescuer. We 
chainless, come and be fearless, come to the foot of Calvary, for there is redemption for every affliction here at the foot of Calvary, so come and be chained. That was wonderful. Man, that is so good. That song service was just awesome. Isn't God good? He is so good to us, and I'm thankful for God. And what God has done for me and my family being here has just been, I could spend the whole day just telling you about it. And so it's so good. God is good. If you're here visiting for the first time, I want to invite you to come back and uh, listen to our pastor when he's here. And uh, we just hope that this service will be a gift to you. And uh, the song service, Pastor Lance, that was phenomenal. Thank you very much to all the team. Thank you so much for putting that together. I'm also thankful for a pastor who leads and loves and cares the way that he does and who's willing to take time to love his family the way that he does. And so I'm thankful for Pastor. And if he's watching, we thank you. And we have a church family that's excited about God and God's word uh, this morning. Uh, And then I'm thankful for you. Many of you have said you are praying for me this morning, and I appreciate I cover your prayers. Sometimes you read a passage in the Bible, um, and you go into that passage with a preconceived idea about what that passage has to say. But sometimes you reread a passage, and you God gives you a new perspective or a new perception from what you read to take away a new truth from from that passage. And this morning, that passage is Luke 15, what we sang about today. Um, God did that for me over the last couple weeks. And so hopefully this is a blessing to you this morning. We're talking about outrageous statements and things that Jesus says to us that just blow us aback and make us wonder, why is Christ, why is Jesus, the Son of God, who is supposed to be loving, saying this to me right now? And so this morning, we're going to focus on the fact that Jesus says, I'm lost. And he says I'm lost for a purpose, and that's what we're going to investigate. If you wouldn't mind turning to Luke chapter number uh, 15. Luke chapter number 15. If you want to open to your bulletin, it's there in your bulletin, your Bible, or your app. Luke chapter number 15. And if you're physically able, I'd like to invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's word. Luke chapter number 15 and verse number 1. Luke chapter number 15, verse Number one. Verse number one says, Then drew near unto him, and that's referring to Jesus, all the publicans and sinners, for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man, Jesus, receiving sinners, and eateth with him. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, Doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your goodness to us. Thank you for the song service. 
I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in hearts here at Emmanuel. And, and just, uh, Lord, we're, we're very thankful. And so this morning, as we come and open your word, we pray that you speak to us through your word. Everybody here is, is in a different position, in a different place in life. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would just uh, speak loud and clear. Lord, we love you. We pray, Lord, that you'd meet with us tonight and bless us today. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Have you ever traveled to a destination um, or thought you were intending to go to a destination and then you end up going to that destination you find out that the place that you ended up going to wasn't the place that you were wanting to go? Uh, maybe you had an opportunity along the way that where you saw some signs where you could tell something was some, just quite off. You know, you, you knew you could tell that you weren't going the right direction, but you persisted anyway. Maybe, guys, you had an opportunity to ask questions, ask if you were going the right way, and you just said, no, nah, I could do it. It was my first wedding anniversary, and we were traveling from Illinois down through Nashville, Tennessee, and, um, and we wanted to celebrate. We wanted to go to a nice restaurant. And so my wife and I thought, hey, let's, let's have some Italian food and let's go eat um, at, um, uh, you know, something nice. You know, just to commemorate one, celebrate one uh, year of being married. And uh, if you're married to, to, to me, that's something to celebrate, right? And so the best place that we could think of was Maggiano's, Little Italy. Has anybody ever been there? Okay, if, you, if you've ever been to Maggiano's, um, you, you'll know what I'm talking about, but they have the family-style dining. It's, it's good. And so uh, this is what we were expecting to go to. And so back then, it's been 12 years, we were using one of those old GPS boxes that you would suction cup to the front for the, to the windshield. You know what I'm talking about? And the problem with those uh, machines is that you had to constantly update them with new maps or else you'd be functioning on faulty information. Well... Sure enough, that box wasn't updated. And so my wife types in Maggiano's Little Italy, and she finds Little Italy. So we're like, yeah, fantastic, let's do it. 15 minutes, you know, off the road, let's, let's go there. So I get off the exit from the freeway, and I'm driving, and I'm like, I know that Maggiano's is typically in a nice area of town. <laughs> this doesn't seem so nice. And so we continue driving, and neither one of us say anything because we're just excited to go and just celebrate and have a good time. So we continue going down the road. But the, the further we go, you know, the further the GPS system guides us, I'm like, internally, I'm just saying, no, this is wrong. Like, why am I going through all these potholes and driving, you know, and everything just kind of seems like gloom and doom, and it's kind of getting a little creepy in this neighborhood. And... Uh, I'm sure the people were wonderful people, but as they, you know, at stop signs, as they walk across the street, kind of nonchalantly press the lock button and just smile, not to be offensive. Don't judge me. You know you do the same thing. (laughs) And so, you know what you do when you're lost? You sit up straight, you turn off the music, And you repeat the directions that you have been given just to make sure that you're going the right way. So turn right on main, turn right on main, 500 feet, turn right on main, turn right on main, right, turn right on main. So we're driving and I'm repeating the directions and I'm like, no, this is wrong. Well, this is what I was hoping to see. And as we got, we're, you know, 500 feet away, 200 feet away. And to our disappointment, really relief, We pull up on this. (laughs) Apparently, Little Italy was ancient. They had replaced it with a different place. They had closed it up. The the windows were boarded, and it wasn't quite what I was anticipating. And so I was like, what in the world? Looking back, it's kind of funny because if, if just with all the markers, with the direction that I was going, I knew I was going the wrong way, but neither of us, one of us said anything. And, and so we persisted anyway. We followed these faulty directions. And so we ended up going to this place, and we're just like, well, I'm glad we're not going to be here. Let's go on. We ended up going to the spaghetti factory, and it was a good day. But um, just operating on faulty information. Maybe you're here this morning, and, and you, uh, you just see all the signs in your life where you feel like you're operating on faulty information. 
Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's in a relationship. Maybe it's uh, at home. Maybe it's at work. Uh, But wherever you are, maybe you're here and you just feel like you're completely lost. You know, the worst thing that you can do when you're lost is to just continue anyway. It's just to continue on a path that you feel that is wrong um, and, and you ignore the signs. Um, if you do a quick Google search for, for these, I'm sure you have plenty of stories to tell, but you'll find some pretty funny things. There was a lady in Europe who was going to take a 90-mile trip to visit her friend in Brussels. She drove and f- blindly followed the directions of her GPS She didn't realize it, that she was going the wrong direction until two days later. 900 miles later. She said that she was following the directions so closely, not distracted, that she didn't even realize that there were two sunsets that had happened. (laughs) One commentator said... She would have asked for directions, but it seemed like everybody was speaking a different language. (laughs) Or you could be like this woman here on the picture who drove her car into the water because her GPS told her so. (laughs) A young Canadian woman drove her Toyota Yaris into a lake in Ontario, Canada because her GPS told her so. To her defense... The police said that the weather conditions at the time showed it was raining, dark, and foggy. Combining weather conditions and the driver being new to the area, a fully submerged vehicle was the result. Jesus may tell you this morning you are lost, and you may feel like it's dark, and it's, and it's foggy, and you can't see the way, and you're trying to figure things out. You don't have to do that on your own. Jesus tells you you are lost for a reason, and that's what we're going to investigate. But before we give you the reason and before you you hear the purpose for this parable, we need to understand a little bit of the background of the story, the context of the story, where Jesus is going to, who is he speaking to, what group of people are there, and why. Typically along Jesus' path, he would come to different uh, people with different motives. Okay, you had some people who believed on Jesus and they, be- and they followed Jesus faithfully. You had another group of people who um, didn't believe Jesus. They thought he was an imposter, a fake, a phony, and they were following him to try to disprove him. Then there was another group of people who would benefit from his mir- miracles. They were fed, I mean, several times, right? And so they were following Jesus to see what they could get out of Jesus. And then there was another group of people who just relegated them just to be just some good teacher, some good, you know, uh, guru. And so there were different motives as to why people follow Jesus. But in this day, Jesus is about a few months away from being crucified. He is confronting people with their belief system. And in our passage, we see four distinct groups of people, each one different and each one at a different stage in life. The first uh, groups of people, you see the publicans and sinners. These were outcasts, and publicans were uh, the tax collectors of the day. They were the ones who would get the taxes from the people, and everybody hated them because they would take those taxes and use the money that they collected to buy and purchase things for themselves. Even some were known to purchase, uh, to build homes with the money that they, that they took. And so everybody just despised the publicans. They just, they just hated these people. The sinners were the group of people that everybody had kind of given up on. You know, the, the, the group of people in society where they just said, you know, they're no good. They don't have any hope. They were just hopeless. So then you have this group of people, and they had, they had come to Jesus to listen to Jesus. They sat down with Jesus, and Jesus invited them in to eat with him. Now, that was offensive to the Pharisees and the scribes, which are the other two groups. The Pharisees were known as people who who kept to the law. They actually added to the law, and they added laws to God's laws because God's laws weren't good enough. They would just add to the law, and they were proud in the fact that they could keep the law, and they would put everybody else. So they were the religious elite. The scribes in that day were kind of like our lawyers of today. They were very meticulous, scrupulous, proud men who could handle historic, historical documents, legal documents, and they were just well-known leaders in that day. And so the Pharisees and the scribes, the social elite, 
looked at Jesus and criticized Jesus for having what they considered the scum of the world sitting with him eating with Jesus. Now, this was offensive because Jesus, all along the way, was claiming that he was God. And he did a pretty good job of proving it. With his miracles and with the things that he taught, he would always silence the crowds. And so here we have uh, Jesus sitting with a group of people that um, is so offensive to this elite crowd, this proud, arrogant, haughty crowd, that they're over there murmuring. Let's go back to the scripture and see what it says about the Pharisees. Verse number 2. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. What they didn't understand is that Jesus only receives sinners who admit that they are sinners. And this morning, you may think that that's an offensive statement. Jesus only receives sinners, only receives those that come with a humble heart to him. But that's the truth. Jesus will only receive somebody who comes and says, yes, I need help. I admit that I am lost. And so here in this passage, we have the publicans and sinners sitting with Jesus and the the religious elite criticizing Jesus. The publicans and sinners came to eat and sit and hear Jesus the religious elite came to criticize and accuse and, and, and badmouth Jesus. And so here, as the, you see the Pharisees and scribes outraged, they couldn't believe this. They were not only outraged, but they were disgusted. I like to start off with the heart of the message being this statement. Jesus' message enrages when received with pride, but it encourages when received with hum- humility. Can you say that with me? Jesus' message enrages when received with pride, but it encourages when received with humility. So Jesus sits down to eat, and he hears, I can hear him hearing this arrogant group talking and criticizing him. And so what does Jesus do? He gets up, and he shares a parable. Now, what you need to understand about this parable today is that it's a three-tiered parable. There are three parts to it. One is about a lost sheep, which is what we're going to look at. The other is about a lost coin. And the last is about a lost son. And so this, gr- this uh, group of parables is to teach them a spiritual lesson. So Jesus looks at these parables and, and he teaches them a lesson and it just infuriates them. To the proud at heart, it enrages them. It gets them so mad that they are sitting there steaming and stewing and not understanding what Jesus is saying. And so first of all, we see the explosiveness in the face of the proud. We're going to look at this this parable through the sets of two eyes. The first being, we're going to look at this parable through the eyes of the proud. The second being, we're going to look at this parable through the eyes of the humble. So let's look at it through the eyes of the proud. First of all, the the Pharisees and scribes, Jesus offended their position. Jesus offended their position. Now, how did he offend their position? Well, notice the beginning of this parable. Jesus does not say, what shepherd loses a sheep? Notice what he says. He says, what man of you? So what he does is Jesus brings the audience that is, that is listening to him into the story. He doesn't talk about a third person story, some, some person who is not there. He brings them into the story. Now, what you need to understand about in that day is that shepherds were looked at as the lowest working class people. So in that day, if you were a shepherd, it was because you fell into that position. It wasn't something that you aspired to be. A shepherd typically became a shepherd if he was out of work or, um, you know, he couldn't do anything else. Um, Sometimes in poor communities what would happen is everybody owned sheep. So um, because it wasn't affordable for them to care for the sheep, they would find one or two or three men to look over their sheep. And, And so in small communities, families would consolidate their sheep, bring them into one flock, a flock maybe like this where there's 100 sheep, and they would assign three members of their community or family to watch over their sheep. So the job of a shepherd was one of the lowest working class. It wasn't something that you looked up to. And so for Jesus to say, which man of you, having lost a sheep, 
was making the Pharisees and scribes to be a shepherd in his story. To them, it offended their position. It was almost like Jesus didn't know he, who he was talking to. And the only way that Jesus does this in his only uh, special way, he brings somebody into the story to teach them a lesson, and this offense was so big. So basically, Jesus was speaking to a proud and arrogant group of people, and he was bringing them into the story, making them the shepherds. Second thing, he offended their proficiency. Notice what Jesus says. He says, what man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, not only does he say that they are shepherds, but he says that they're incompetent shepherds. They're stupid shepherds. They can't keep track of even one sheep. You are a shepherd in the story and you're losing your pets. You know, how offensive, you know, to these proud people. Like that was like one in the world. You know, the, this, this parable is get, becoming more and more offensive to them. And so he reduces their position to a shepherd. He reduces their proficiency in saying that, he, that they had lost their sheep. And then he offended their priorities. Notice this. He says, having lost uh, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. Now, sheep are considered dumb animals. And uh, they're, they're prone to wander. They're prone to get hurt. They're prone to get diseased. They can't de defend themselves. In the Jewish culture, though, in that day, everybody had sheep. It was just a, uh, a part of their culture that was very important. But for them, for Jesus to say that they would have lost a sheep and then gone into the wilderness, leaving the 90 and 9 in the care of other shepherds so they could go find another sheep, to them, the value of that sheep would have been negligible. They would have said, no, just let that sheep go. We're not going to pay a shepherd a day's wage. Who knows where the sheep ended up? Right, who knows if it just, if it died or, you know, if it, if it got hurt. Just let it go. Just chalk it up as a loss. We'll buy another sheep. They would have, in their human calculation, figured out and, you know, is it worth it to even go chase after the sheep? So what Jesus was saying is that these men, they misprioritized. They would have gone in to the wilderness and they would have done whatever they needed to do to find the sheep. And to them, they would have said, no, they, they would have never done that. Going through the sticks and the briars and the thorns, through the rocky terrain, just to find a sheep, no way. So it was offensive uh, to their priorities. And last of all here, it was offensive to their perception. Notice the end. Jesus just puts a, a cap on his offense to these Pharisees and scribes, to the proud people in that day. Notice what he says. He says in verse number 5, and when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And he, uh, when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Notice this, verse number 7. This is great. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over the ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Boom! That was just amazing. What he's saying here is that, and they knew. So the, so the scribes and Pharisees, they looked at themselves as needing no repentance. Why did they have to repent? They were perfect men. They were upright men. They kept the law. They handled the, the, the most valuable artifacts and historical documents in that day. There's no need for repentance. God looks on us with favor, and God looks on the sinners and the publicans uh, because they are men of disrepute. Uh, look down on them. Look up to us. We are great. And so here what Jesus is saying is, no, God is celebrating over the sinners. And I can see Jesus pointing to the sinners and publicans that are sitting with him more than over 99 just persons who don't need to repent. And I could imagine him pointing to them. Wow. This was offensive. This was just a, a shot. This was an atomic bomb to their psyche. They didn't get it. They didn't understand why Jesus was saying this. And so the offense gets greater and greater when Jesus describes um, to these men that they are not 
the people that God is rejoicing or delights in. And to them, they're like, no way. There's no way that God's going to delight over the publicans and sinners and over me. And so as he looks at, at the story, as we finish the, sto- the first part of this parable, um, we see that these men are proud and arrogant. There are men who would have said, well, I, you know, I financially contribute to society. I can stand on my own two feet. I, you know, I hire other people under me. There are men of, of great reputation. And a lot of times when Jesus speaks to us, he hits at those things that we take most pride in. We, he, he hits at those things that just, that we gloat in, that we find our identity in. He hits at those things that, that boost us up and make us feel like we are somebody. Jesus knocks those things down because he wants us to realize that without him, we are lost. We are lost. And we're lost. And that was just so offensive to them in that day. And so as we As we finish this claim, Jesus tells this parable, you see the outrage in the hearts and lives of these Pharisees and scribes. They are just upset and stewing and murmuring. And then we realize, wait, hold on. There's another set of people sitting in that same group there that are listening to the story who are full of joy. Who are they? They're the publicans and they're the sinners. Why can they listen to the same story? Why can they listen to the same parable but not be so offended. Jesus included them in the story as well. Well, I've asked uh, Pastor Lance and Pastor Derek to help me with an illustration, just to kind of picture what this is. And so um, we're going to have Pastor Derek. He's going to be the shepherd. He's going to be the the proud and arrogant Pharisees and scribes here. Good job. You're doing a great job there. And we're going to have Pastor Lance be the lamb right here, the humble, the, the publicans and sinners. Everybody has given up on... Pastor Lance, and, uh, and so here we have the two groups of people. In that day, Jesus is speaking. Now, the problem with these people is that they're listening to the story, and they're so upset because they're the shepherds, and basically what Jesus is saying is that they've been reduced to a low position. They're incompetent. They're not able. And so in the story, God, at the end of the story, doesn't rejoice over them, so they're offended. How in the world would God do that? But then we have this other group of people, the publicans and sinners, and Jesus draws a straight line from the sheep being lost to sinners repenting and God rejoicing. And so the publicans and sinners are sitting there and they're like, yes, that's me. I need help. I need a savior. Yes. And so they relate to that and they're, they're, they're coming to Jesus to that offense with a humble heart. Now this is the thing. If this group of people can humble their hearts and accept the offense that Jesus says, I'm lost. Then what happens is that they're able to move from this side over to that side and become a part of the story there. Now what happens though? This is really cool. So now we have a person who have said, oh, I I am humble. I understand that they wouldn't say I'm humble because that's proud. But they would have said, "Um, uh, I need help. I am lost. I need a savior. I need to be rescued. And I understand that Jesus is the one who can rescue me. Well, now there's an empty spot in the story. The shepherd, if he moves over here now, he's a part of the flock. The shepherd here enters Jesus and he says, let me be the shepherd. Let me do for you what you're offended even to do for yourself. Let me step in and be the rescuer. Let me step in and be the one that's going to remove your chains. And so Jesus... We'll come over here to the cross. He becomes the shepherd, and he says, I am the shepherd. I am going to save you. You just allow, you just take the offense. Just agree with me that I am lost. I am lost, and I need help. And so once you agree with me, that allows me to come in and rescue you. Does that make sense? And so what a beautiful story. One story, two truths. If you enter that story with a proud, arrogant heart, you're always going to be offended at Jesus' message. But if you humble yourself and say, yes, I need a Savior, then you come to it with a humble heart. Thank you guys very much. That's awesome. Give give them a hand. That was awesome. You guys did great. Now we're going to look at this passage, and this is what fills our hearts with grace. When we look at the passage through the eyes of the humble, 
When we look at the passage through the eyes of what Jesus is really saying, what he's really doing when he says, you are lost. What is Jesus doing? He's not just trying to say that to me because he wants to offend me. He's saying that to me because he loves me. And so we jump into the story here, and the first thing we see is that love is concerned. Love is concerned. So we see the embracing love at the humble of heart, and love is concerned for the lost. Love is, so if you flip this story around, now you see that Jesus, being that reduced position, being that, in that position of a shepherd, a position that nobody wanted to be, Jesus enters and he says, I'll be that shepherd. Now the Bible calls Jesus the good shepherd. And a good shepherd in that day would have accounted for a sheep. He would have made sure that he didn't lose any sheep. And so he was always watching and always looking and making sure that he watched over his sheep. Can I tell you this morning that you may feel like you're invaluable, that you don't have any value, that, that you aren't valuable maybe because your skills aren't like somebody else's or maybe you compare yourself to somebody else, but that is just a lie because the shepherd says you are valuable. You're valuable and he is loved and he's concerned over you and he's looking for you and he's watching over you and he's accounting for you. And he says, you are lost, but he's saying that to you because he wants to love you and he wants to bring you into his flock. I love what Warren Wearsby said about the lost things and how God views lost things. He says here in this three-tiered parable, the first part for the sheep being lost, he was out of the place of safety. For the coin to be lost, it was out of the place of circulation. So it was useless. For the son to be lost, he was out of the place of love. When God lost us in the Garden of Eden, when we sinned, he lost the thing that he had his greatest affection on. And he understands what it means for us to be lost even more so than we understand it. And so when he looks at us in our lost condition or our helpless and hopeless condition, what he sees is a place, a, a person who is out of his care, out of his protection. He sees a person who is, uh, who is out of the place of being a useful, uh, not, not in man's uh, comparison, but just in, in, the, in the picture of eternity, out of the place of circulation, out of the place of where he could use that person for a greater good. And then we see, he sees a person that's out of the place of his love and care. And so that's what he wants to do. He wants to bring people into his flock. And so remember, as we look at this, we see this story now through the eyes of the humble. And we see that it's the shepherd that is really caring and watching over every single person who is valuable. The second thing here is that love is committed to the lost. Love is committed to the lost. Now, we said before that sheep are just dumb animals. Remember, they're prone to wander. They're prone to, to get disease. They're, they, they can't protect themselves. And so sheep, if you were to put a price tag on them, the expense in that story to have a shepherd go find a lost sheep, in man's calculation, is not worth it. It's not worth it. We would have, you know, just any of us would just say, no, 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 just you know, unless, I mean, if, unless it became your pet, and then you wanted to go search for Fluffy, then you would probably go after it. You know, even, even pay people to find it. But um, just, you know, for, out of man's calculation, we would have just said, no, let's just take the loss, continue on. But God doesn't say that. He doesn't say that with anybody. He doesn't say that with one single, he doesn't say that anybody is invaluable. And in fact, he doesn't, not only does he say that everybody is valuable, but he's saying, I am committed to every single person. And as you think of this story, you think of the shepherd going back through the thorns and the thicket and the briars and working through that rocky terrain, probably working through this and bleeding himself and getting cut up and working through the, the mountain, calling for his sheep, listening for the bleeding of the sheep and going to do whatever he needs to do to find that sheep. And you can imagine that shepherd going to the uh, sheep once it finds the sheep, putting the sheep on his shoulders, both shoulders, holding the sheep on his back, bearing the burden on his shoulders, committed to that burden. Not only is it difficult to go find the sheep, 
But it's difficult to bring the sheep out of the same place that he went to go in to find the sheep. I see the shepherd committed to going to seek the lost, committed to bring out the lost, and then to bring him in to a joyous celebration. And so as we watch this parable, we can picture the shepherd going and carrying that burden, but that burden isn't a burden, it's really his joy. You are God's joy. You are God's joy. We are God's joy. God loves us. And so it's not a burden to God to carry us and to find us and to seek us out. He loves us. We are no burden. We are his joy. As I started thinking about that story, um, I was reminded of a song that my father-in-law used to sing when he was in high school. The song is called, and some of you may know the song, it's called, He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother. And uh, so that song was written many years ago, and I, I thought of the idea that, um, that to, to God, even we think that it's a burden, but to him it's not a burden to carry us out and to, and to carry us out. And I'm thinking of this story. And so I thought, let me research that song. Let me see. Um, where did that song originate? And so there are so many stories online. But the earliest uh, resource uh, that I can find, the earliest place that I could find uh, where this phrase was used is actually in a book uh, written in 1884. Um, And it's pretty surprising. So I was going to and I was researching and this author named James Wells, who actually was in ministry, he writes, he wrote a book on the parables of Jesus So I'm looking through this book, and I go to Luke, chapter number 15. I'm like, no way. I'm reading through it, reading through his notes, and he uses this phrase, he ain't heavy, he's my brother, to describe the shepherd bringing out the sheep. I was like, no way. That's crazy. I had the same thought that this guy over 100 years ago had. uh, He had that same thought. Let me read to you what he wrote. He said, you see the shepherd clamoring with his sheep on his shoulders, a heavy burden in a hot day over a rocky path. But he feels, that the little, uh, he feels like that little girl carrying that big boy who was asked if she were not tired, replied in a tone of surprise, no, he's not heavy. He's my brother. The shepherd's burden is his joy. What value Christ sets on one soul when he does all to bring him into his fold. I like to say this morning that if you feel like you're invaluable, God is committed to you. He loves you. He goes in. He went into the the deepest and worst uh, uh, rescue mission ever in the history of man to rescue us from our sin. He went to the cross, died on the cross, shed his blood, died on that cross, was buried three days, three nights later, and rose again because he loves you. And we get to be a part of his story today. And we get to part of, be a part of his story if we agree with him and say, I agree, I'm lost. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to come over here and put myself, I want to be a sheep. I'm that lost sheep. I want to be that sheep and I, wanna be, I need a savior. And then for us to call upon him, we see that a savior who is committed to the lost also celebrates when the lost is found. Love celebrates when the lost is found. You can imagine that a a person coming into Jesus in this story, Jesus alludes to the fact of what is actually going on in heaven when somebody says, I am lost, I humble myself, I need a savior, and then comes into a relationship with him. Jesus said that in heaven, there is rejoicing. There is rejoicing. Think of the greatest rejoicing celebration that you've ever had. Maybe it was last year's Super Bowl. Maybe not. Depends. If you're an Eagles fan or if you're, you know, uh, maybe let's put that aside. Let's continue on. Uh, That just went downhill. Maybe it was two years ago. I can't remember two years ago if you're a Patriots fan. Yeah! You know, you won the Super Bowl and how we celebrate and we all get together. We bring the food and, and, and we just bring the food so it can fly when we celebrate, right? The popcorn goes everywhere, the Doritos. And, and we just, we celebrate these, these moments that really, if you were to look at them, they really don't have any value. I mean, it's just, I mean, I, I do enjoy sports, but in the course of time, they really don't have value. But Jesus says, 
when you are able to rejoice, when you are able to accept the fact that I am lost and I need a Savior, God in heaven says, yes! It's the biggest celebration that you will ever witness in heaven. And that's what he says. And so it's only for those that are willing to come and be humble and say, I accept the fact that Jesus says that I'm lost. But it takes two. So it takes two to make that decision. It's kind of like a marriage. In a marriage, I didn't go to my wife and say, hey, I like you. You're going to marry me. She would have probably ran the other way and thought that I was a creeper. <laughs> there was a mutual decision. I said, I love you. She said she loved me. And we decided both, hey, let's enter into this relationship together, a covenant. And that's what Jesus does. He initiates the conversation. He says, hey, to all of you that feel lost, you see the warning signs. I'm lost. You feel lost inside. You think that you're lost. Hey, let me just tell you, you're lost. He initiates a conversation, but he's saying that to you so you come in. And once you decide, I want to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, he's already committed. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He is committed. He's committed. He's just waiting. He's waiting for anyone. Anyone. It doesn't matter where you are, your background, your status of life, what you've done. He's waiting. And so this morning, whether you're a Christian or not, maybe you've, you've fallen away from the Lord and you just need, you can't feel like you can come back. Hey, he's waiting. He loves you. Come back. And uh, maybe you're, you're following the Lord. Um, we celebrate with those who come to the Lord, right? We celebrate for anybody who wants to enter into this special covenant with Jesus Christ. Today, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you have an opportunity to make a spiritual decision and say, I want to make Jesus Christ my own. I want to, make, I want to come into a relationship with him. Uh, it's not a spooky decision. It's not a weird decision. It's just uh, a decision. It's a, sp it's a spiritual decision, but it's a faith-based decision. And by faith, we come into a special relationship with Jesus Christ. And so as you think about where you're at, Jesus may say you're lost, but it's not to offend you, it's to love you. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us, for going to the cross, loving us the way that you do, speaking the truth in love, guiding us, helping us, and calling out to us, quite frankly, and telling us the truth that if we're lost, we need somebody, we need a healer, we need a rescuer to come and save us. And so, Lord, this morning as we sit here and we discern where we're at in life, Lord, I pray that you just make it clear uh, to all of our church family and guests alike what they need to do. With our eyes closed and our head bowed, if you're here and you want to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, I said it was a faith-based decision. It's a decision that you make by faith and you ask him in your heart. And you can ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior simply by praying a prayer like this. Heavenly Father, I understand that I'm a sinner, but I'd like to accept your gift of salvation. I want to come into a relationship with you. Please come into my heart and save me. Simple prayer like that, even in your own words, a decision to follow Christ faithfully. If you're here and you heard what I said, and maybe for the first time in your life you decided that you wanted to receive Christ as your Savior, we're rejoicing with you as a church family. But I'd like to ask you, if you're sitting here and you've made that decision, to look up at me just for a second if you made that decision. And, um, and I just want you to look up at me. I'd like to just show you as a gift from our church to you, um, if you made that decision, we'd like to give you a Bible just to kind of commemorate that decision, just to make this moment special. And so at the end of the service, if you have made that decision, we'd like to invite you back in the back of the auditorium. There are next step tables. Come to one of them and just say, I, I prayed with Pastor Stephen and I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And they'll give you a Bible and, uh, and that would be great. If you are a part of our church family and you're here and you're trying to discern 
how the Lord is speaking to you and you just feel lost, I'd like to invite you to call to him. At this moment, the instrumentalists are going to play. Please stand and we'll have a moment of response. Respond as we sing this morning. Lord, here I am to worship light of the world. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow. So highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to this earth you created. All for love's sake became poor. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow. We love you. God, we thank you that when we're lost, Lord, you come and find us. Lord, I pray that you'd help us today, Lord, in, in moments and times in our life when we feel like we are lost, Lord, to look to you, the ultimate shepherd of our hearts. Lord, I pray that you'd be with us now as we give. I pray that what we give today would be sent out, Lord, would be used and spent for the glorious gospel of Christ. We pray this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope that you've enjoyed the service and you've been encouraged. Next week, we'll finish up our outrageous series and enjoy a special celebration Sunday together. We'll celebrate those who are taking exciting next steps in their relationship with Jesus and enjoy a lunch downstairs after the service. Plan to bring a dish and stick around for a bit next week. If you're interested in learning more about trusting Jesus, following him in baptism, or joining a discipleship group, we invite you to stop by the next step tables in the back of the worship center on your way out. Tomorrow, I'll be taking the teen guys to Brownstone Water Park for our Elevate Guys Extreme. And then on Tuesday, Hillary will be taking the Elevate Girls. The cost is $35. We're meeting at the church at 9 a.m., so hope you can make it. If you have any questions about this, see me right after the service. Emmanuel Christian Academy is a ministry of our church and desires to educate K-4 through 12th grade students with biblical values and academic excellence. The first day of school is now just one week away. Enrollment has continued to climb and we're excited to welcome back both new and returning students. Stop by the school table in the center hallway for more information about ECA. Well, I'm excited to tell you that our first starting point class with me and Dana is full and it begins September the 9th. Now, if you're new to Emmanuel, Starting Point is a relaxed environment where you can enter into conversations about Christianity. You can bring your questions, and it's a great time not only to get to know us and others, but uh, to learn more about the gospel and about Jesus and about Emmanuel Baptist Church. Now, here's why I'm telling you this. Even though this class for September the 9th is full, we're starting a list for the next starting point class. So today, on your way out, go by any Next Step table and put your name on the list for the next starting point class, and we'll be in touch. Community Day is a special opportunity to invite, welcome, and thank our community servants. Our first responders, medical personnel, our government leaders, and our educators all do so much for us. So begin thinking now of who you can invite and thank on September 30th. This is going to be an exciting day, so make plans to get involved and join us. 
Husbands and Wives, this fall, our annual marriage retreat will be held on November 16th and 17th. Get away and refresh your marriage at this fun and encouraging weekend. We're going to welcome Pastor Troy Durrell, and we're excited about a new location this year just outside of Boston. Registration's now open online, so begin your plans to attend this year's Refreshed Marriage Retreat. Whether you're a first-time guest or a regular attender, we invite you back to grow with us next Sunday morning. If you haven't received a gift bag, stop by the Welcome Center in the lobby on your way out. We have a special gift there just for you. We want you to know that throughout the week, you can connect with us on social media and at ebcnewington.com, or you can listen and share the podcast on iTunes. We hope you have a great week. You are dismissed.